welcome to what is sadly the last episode on Judaism and ecology and all these fantastic environmental issues that uh, uh, Michael Kalati has been discussing uh, with us very very complex issues which he's, he's made very very uh, bite size and and uh, very accessible and I have to say Michael I've, I've really enjoyed uh, the episode so far it, it you know it, these are, are topics which rarely see the light of day you know I, I, I mean I think you'll agree with me well I, I agree with you um, it's something that's kind of in society also been swept under the rug yeah and it's been delayed and procrastinated but I think that the time is now we have to act we have to stand up we have to get on with the job and uh, you know take responsibility you know for what for what seems to be an impending doom but please I don't want people to be very very nervous that nothing can be done it is something that has to be dealt with but it can be dealt with if we all pull together and we are concerted about our our, our efforts and um, that we stand up and and start the job yeah yeah I think it's also very important to mention that um, that all, all these things are actually his uh, Lord it's just effort what should accompany this is prayer you know because because uh, whatever we do we're just little small cogs that are just doing our little bit but ultimately it's Hashem which will bring the Rachamim and uh, will, will help us from the situation but, but the, 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 the thing which is of major concern is, is that we're not even doing our Hishtad Lut that's yeah, what that's we're saying we have so, so we have to get started very good so Michael what are we going to be discussing today uh, well, I'd like to talk about um, climate change the facts about climate change and our intention and attitude towards it. You know, mm. we have just um, recently, uh, we had Rosh Hashanah uh, on this, and, and during the second day, the Torah portion in, uh, in, uh, was from um, Bereshis, chapter 22, verse 1, started with God hailing Avraham, who responds with the one word, Hineni, here I am. Mm. We must adapt. We must adapt this uh, attitude of Hineni, here I am, to our efforts regarding tackling climate change. There are various methods that we can combat it. Chiefly, if you're looking as an individual, my personal opinion is that um, reduction of the carnivory trade and the carnivory industry that that, that uh, contributes approximately 50% of greenhouse gases. Um, you know, a, a, a return or a turning to a vegan or vegetarian diet will combat this immediately. It's what each of us can do mm. and have the most effect. So wow. that's my personal um, opinion. Can, can, can I just say, did you say 50%? Five, five, oh? five zero. Five, that is 50 an, uh, that is an unbelievable yes, statistic. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's a lot from um, uh, methane from the um, gases that cows give off. There are mm. um, billions of cattle that are just waiting around, waiting to be slaughtered. And such a huge number gives off such a huge amount of methane, which is an unbelievably potent greenhouse gas. It's something like an order of 30 times more potent than CO2. What? This is methane. Um, this is a, it's a, and it takes a long time to come out of the atmosphere. So. Um, that is probably a bigger um, chunk than is from fossil fuels and from cars. It's from the carnivory trade. So we all have it within our power to make a small sacrifice. Like Avraham was mm. asked to sacrifice his only son. Yeah. Um, this is a small sacrifice. It's, it's a small but, but, sacrifice, but, but, uh, yeah. exactly. We have to but now. We have to turn around and say, "Hineni, here I am." Yeah. Wow. You know, it's more than. Uh, it's more than. You know, Hineni is more than a physical location. It's a declaration that, that we're ready to transform ideals into actions, to um, concretize one's beliefs into conduct. Uh, Rashi uh, suggested Hineni, and I quote, "is the language of humility and readiness." You know, the time for thinking, evaluating, and pontificating is over. Now it's time to act. Uh, the Parsha and Boratius goes on to show that Hineni means not just moving from thought to action, 
but even reversing course if one is traveling down the wrong path. In Bereshis chapter 22 verse 11, an angel interrupts Avraham just as he's about to sacrifice Isaac. How does Avraham respond? He says, Hineni, here I am. The angel tells Avraham to sacrifice an animal instead of his son, and Avraham complies. He obeys God and finds a more enlightened path. You know, we also heard the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, which also serves as a wake-up call. It's, it's a repeated, sharp, piercing blast are meant to rouse us from our slumber, yes, absolutely. to startle us you know, into urgent action. Mm. Uh, again, it says in Kohelet, Hashem said to, uh, to Adam, look at my work, see how beautiful they are, how excellent. For your sake I created them. Um, see to it that you do not despoil and destroy my world. If you do, there will be no one after you to repair it. In Kohelet Rabbah, seven, chapter 7, verse 13. You know, today we have um, a reliance on fossil fuels, and they come with um, a whole host of moral dilemmas. Um, we have something called um, hydraulic fra uh, fracturing, it's fracking. Basically what this does, it shoots industrial fluid deep into the earth, to release natural gas and this could endanger our freshwater drinking supply our freshwater table they call it can, can, can you so can you uh, can you explain what what is a fossil fuel F fossil fuel is basically from a long time ago um, all the vegetation that had um, that had um, fallen to the earth and over time it got buried under new earth Mm -hmm. And as it got buried deeper and deeper, it got more and more compressed and older and older, it turned into um, like an oil. Right. Like that's all that we find, and charcoal. Now the mm -hmm. problem is, in a, that in itself is not a danger to the earth because it's sequestered, it's buried under the earth. The problem is that when we, we are the only... <sighs> since how many years i don't know a few hundred couple of hundred within the last couple of hundred years or 120 years we've extracted these buried compounds and have decided to strike a match to them and light them and realize that they burn consistently and they're able to power our mechanized vehicles now that of in itself that they within the earth are not a problem but we bring them out of the earth mm -hmm. and we burn them we then put into the atmosphere the smoke that is inevitably has to be released from them the problem is the planet has not devised a way to deal with something that was always supposed to be sequestered under the earth so this it's like it's like our planet is like we, do you remember in the 70s or 80s there was this boy in the bubble no. There, was this, there was this boy that was ill and he couldn't oh. breathe the air yeah. and all he could, he had to sit in a transparent plastic hard bubble yeah and he had to live his life there until they found mm -hmm. the cure for him it was a famous story in the 80s the boy in the bubble the boy wow. in the bubble is a famous story google wow. it if you don't. okay so you have to imagine that we're that we're all sitting like if i was sitting with you in this bubble yeah and i took out of pack of cigarettes and I started to smoke it oh, we have a gosh. limited amount of air in there you'd say what the hell are you yeah, doing yeah. you know so this but we're in the same situation we're almost taking a cigarette in this bubble yeah. lighting it and pretending nothing's wrong but we're choking ourselves and this is and the, there's no way that the planet has no way of dealing with these new fumes that are being created by pulling them out of the earth and burning them for our mechanized society yeah. it's you could say it's accidental you know it's, we didn't know this would be the consequence right. but now we do know so we have to take action mm. you know the industrial the, uh, the industrial revolution happened it's happened we've got to deal with the consequences of it you can't you can't ignore it anymore mm. you know you have things like in 2011 you had a nuclear reactor that was uh, that had a meltdown that contaminated a lot of the uh, region's air water and crops you know nuclear energy does pose some dangers but you know nuclear energy is probably if it's har harnessed correctly is not the worst thing but oil extraction uh, from 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 various ways uh, generates about three times as much greenhouse gases emissions as the production of conventional oil 
Mm. Um, but, the, but this is from tar sands. This is a process that's being used recently. But the practice is increasing. We seem to also be extracting coal. It's also they're, tr they're starting to bring coal, the coal industry back, which is also a terrible thing. We have to look for new green ways, innovative ways, harnessing uh, the wind. Perhaps like Israel is, you know, is very. Uh, in the forefront of using wind and wave technologies. They're free energy. It's free yeah, energy. Yeah. The, the waves are going to crash against the shore 24 hours a day with incredible power. Why not harness, find a way of harnessing and containing the energy that is drawn from that? Hmm. But we, we, we need to address our dependency on fossil fuels. And uh, and in, and increase our energy security. We need energy. We can't just the world can't just shut down. You know, people are not going to stop using oil or petrol until there's an alternative. The problem is that really international commitments have not been held to. Like I mentioned in the first episode, the governments really they they politicians they serve four year. Uh, terms. They're not interested in the hard choices. They're interested in pleasing people. So don't rely on them. We have to, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we've reached a point where if we don't act now, it's going to be perhaps too late. So we're forced into a corner. We've got to act. Simple mm -hmm. as that. Mm -hmm. Can't wait for policymakers to make their, you know, their their moves. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, Bobby Taufan taught us that we are not obliged to complete the task, but neither can we desist from it. You know, the task is a great task. Mm -hmm. The idea of Tikkun Olam has two meanings here. One is the literal repair of the world. The planet is broken with more carbon in the atmosphere than our systems can handle. Uh, in 2008, the then NASA climatologist James Hansen and his team reported that any value of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is, I quote, not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Today, as of today, uh, we're at 412 parts per million. So way beyond what is deemed very dangerous to life. So what, 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 can you give us two figures again? 350 parts per million is what the NASA climatologist said quote, not compa 350 parts per million mm -hmm. in the atmosphere is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. We are now at 412 oh, parts. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we, so it's beyond, you know, yeah. we, 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 we've procrastinated. We're well into the, 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 the red on that exactly. one. Exactly. Wow, you wow. know, uh, uh, there's a, the, the commandment, um, thou shalt conserve energy. Uh, there is no commandment, biblical commandment, but there is the 529th commandment, which is the Baltashkas, which is thou shalt not waste, a principle that has uh, gone far back in the Talmud, specifically includes uh, not wasting energy. Um, to understand how sages at the time of the Talmud, more than 1500 years ago, could mandate energy efficiency as a matter of Jewish law, we have to grasp the legal category of being a Baltashkas, you know, concerning destruction and figuratively do not waste. Um, this law originates in Devorim chapter 20 verse 19 which tells us not to cut down an enemy's tree during a siege. Um, tradition reasoned that even if even if, uh, f if it's forbidden even in wartime when the military advantage gain might affect soldiers lives then we surely should not cut down trees wantonly in ordinary situations. Since the law was specific to fruit trees, the economic interpretation um, became um, to fell them only when the benefit is markedly greater than the value of all the fruit that they might ever yield. This is a calculus that tilts towards conservation now that we know that trees impart massive value far beyond their fruits, such as providing wood for uh, for habitats and for furniture and and uh, sequestering, which is pulling down carbon from the atmosphere, uh, preventing erosion and generating oxygen. Hmm. Uh, the rabbis of the Talmud did not understand Baltashkas as a precept solely concerned with fruit trees, but rather as a far-reaching principle which defines our responsibilities and obligations to the created world. 
uh, Rav Zutra, who was a 4th century Babylonian scholar, specifically uh, forbade us to um, conserve, uh, bade us to conserve fossil fuel. Uh, in a discussion on lamps in uh, Talmud Bavli, in, Sh- in Shabbat's Daf 67 on the base, Rav Zutra says simply, and I quote, whoever covers an oil lamp or uncovers a naphtha lamp violates Baal Tashlis. Mm. Rashi also explains that such a violator, as a quote, speeds up the burning process, end quote, by failing to cover or uncover the flame in the way that minimizes how much fuel is burnt. By implication, according to Jewish law, consumers are responsible to understand their fuel burning appliances and their fuels and to employ the best available methods for conserving that fuel as much as possible. Beyond lamps, most modern machines are powered by far away carbon intensive coal combustion or by gasoline set internally ablaze. Um, though the few authorities in, in Jewish law have fully extended Rav Zutra's logic to today's fossil fuel use, you know, it's, it's easy to see how it, it sort of um, appliances should be mandated, you know. Um, gas guzzlers and, and these sort of sports utility vehicles should, you know, are really not in line with that. And um, perhaps a variety of new regimens should be uh, adopted. You know, such if you ob- obey these sort of laws of uh, conservation, um, it serves also, in, it says in Boratius chapter 2, verse 15, to serve and guard the land. Uh, which is a, a concept of Yeshua Ve'ed's trial, making the land as habitable and sustainable as possible. We're also reminded of the Torah commandments in Devorim chapter 22, verse 8, and I quote, to put a parapet, like a low railing, around the roof. Is that a marker? That's yeah, the, the ra- uh, yeah. Correct, yeah. yeah. This is what ecologists call the precautionary principle. It reminds us that public safety and health must come before private profits. Such a precautionary approach certainly should guide our response to today's climate crisis, in which wasteful energy uh, drives even more massive adverse impacts on the on the poor, on the planet, and on our progeny. Um, to aid and abet the rapid warming of Earth goes against a host of Jewish values and mandates from like in Vayikra, it says, love your neighbor, in chapter 19, verse 18, to in uh, Devorim, chapter 13, verse 19, to choose life that you and your descendants may live, and in Tehillim, chapter 34, seek peace and pursue it. Basically, in order to defend these values and to limit the impact of climate change, we really must return to the conservationist logic of Rav Zutra, According to the uh, Sefer Chinuch, adherence to Baltash is an ethical litmus test. And uh, as uh, the author, I uh, quote the author, righteous people of good deeds are aghast at any wanton waste and do all in their power to stop it, while the wicked are not thus. They delight in destroying the world even as they destroy themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, in his book Choreb, A Philosophy of Jewish Laws and Observances, uh, deem the command to conserve a quote the first and most general call of God very serious mm. conservation is a core Jewish practice and energy conversation is a mitzvah I believe mm. now I'd like to perhaps describe to people who are not aware of what exactly is climate change um, what, what, what is it we're worried about what is this unseen Uh, menace. Um, Climate change refers to a drift in the average temperature over time. Now what causes this average temperature to change? Um, We have a stable climate when heating and cooling rates are in balance. Really, because the Earth is such a complex system, it's never truly in balance at any one time everywhere. It's normally up and down everywhere, but overall it balances itself out. Over the last thousand years we've seen a stable global average temperature but there's been a rapid 
temperature increase over the last century. Uh, I've seen graphs that show the spike mm. and it's absolutely clear as day that something is afoot and the spike is nothing like the previous uh, temperature ranges. It's triple it's you know it's like a it's like a spike that you think you know it's it's frightening mm. um it's it's if you you know it's the heating is no longer in balance with the cooling like um, an overheating car yeah exactly yeah. well where is the source of heating from you know what um the, the fundamental heat source of the earth is the sun the sun's rays arrive at the top of the Earth's atmosphere. About one third of the sunlight hits the top of the clouds and is reflected backwards into space. The rest passes through the atmosphere and hits the surface of the Earth. When the sunlight hits the surface, some of the light is reflected back out and the rest is absorbed. The absorbed portion is the energy that heats the Earth, which needs to be heated but within balance. The amount of sunlight that is absorbed compared to what is reflected depends on the surface reflectivity. For example, cement is reflective, so little energy is absorbed. But if you step from as onto asphalt, like in a road, from the pavement to the road, on a very, very hot day, you notice the difference in temperature. The dark asphalt absorbs more sunlight. So if you take that as a global concept, yeah. Um, dark surfaces like the ocean absorb a lot of heat but bright surfaces like snow reflect a lot Isn't that the same with light as well? Isn't it dark colours absorb light and light colours Yeah, reflect it reflect so light, so light colours like snow reflect yeah. and the dark colours like the ocean absorb, absorb. The ocean is, yeah. a, is, a great, is a great help to us The ocean does the most um, absorption of heat by far, it's the biggest help of the planet. What it does is, uh, it's because it's two thirds, at least two thirds of the surface area, and so it absorbs it. And as it gets deeper, it gets colder, so uh -huh. it gets dragged down. It gets dragged down and it dissipates. And also, the ocean is the greatest sequester of CO2. In other words, the plant life, the algae in the oceans, basically grow through. CO2 being dragged down from the upper surface to the lower surface by means of heat osmosis. Okay. Uh, it's pulled down. So it's pulled down, it's turned into algae like seaweed, and then yeah. eventually it drops to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. And eventually, after a certain period of time, a long amount of time, it turns into the floor, the seabed. The seabed so uh -huh. the ocean has been doing this for a long time. But now we're putting in too much CO2 and the imbalance has been tipped against it and it can't catch up. So it can't catch up. It's doing its job fantastically. If it remained fallow, if there was a Schmitter year for the planet, yeah. it would immediately be working and helping us. But yeah. because we don't, because it's relentless, our, our, our production of CO2 is only increasing. We only increased it. We've not taken any. We're not. There's no dip. There's been no dip in history. There's been no, you know, standing back and saying, "What are we doing?" So something really um, should be done. So let's talk about cooling a little bit. Um, as the sun heats the planet's surface, the Earth cools itself by sending off energy into space. The cooling has to stay in balance with the heating or the temperature will change. The surface gives off heat and the hotter the surface temperature, the more heat is given off. Of the heat that passes through the atmosphere, some of it escapes into space and some is absorbed by the atmosphere. When the energy is absorbed by the atmosphere, it is re-emitted both up and down. The downward component contributes to the heating of the surface while the upward component is cooling. So how much heat is absorbed by the atmosphere? It, that depends on the greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. The greenhouse gases constitute, um, the, the greenhouse gases are, are constituents of the atmosphere that absorb and trap heat. The most common is water vapor, about 2% of the atmosphere. The water vapor is actually the most, um, the biggest cause of uh, a greenhouse effect. But there are some wave lights in infrared light 
that can pass through the water vapor and escape back into space, thus cooling the surface. These, these windows, so to speak, are in the infrared spectrum or transparent, just like the atmosphere is transparent to visible sunlight. So, what, so if the water vapor is the problem, what's the big deal about carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases? Well, carbon dioxide exists at a much lower concentration in the atmosphere, only about half a percent or 0.4 percent. Um, but it is a powerful greenhouse gas because it absorbs light in the window regions of the spectrum that water vapor doesn't. So a tiny bit of carbon dioxide absorbs and remits a tremendous amount of heat. The concentration, the parts per million of carbon dioxide has increased from about 280 parts per million at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which was about mid 18th century, mm -hmm. to today's value of 412 parts per million. Mm -hmm. Climate scientists are convinced that the increased concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the major cause of the recent increase in temperature. There's no room, for, there's no doubt anymore. It's, it's obvious when you look at the data, all of these satellites that are analyzing that the latest state of the art analyze specifically for these things and they mm -hmm. show th in black and white, in color actually, mm -hmm. you know, the live uh, situation in the atmosphere. You can't, and it's, they show it's, it's anthropomorphic, it's, a, it's made by man, it's contributed by man. Um, well, we have to look at the, that number as um, 412. This is a very high number. This is way above the 350 parts per million that was believed to be the limit. We are way above that now. The fact that we have exceeded this number suggests that even if we modestly reduce our emission rates, it will not avert severe climate change. So, what do we do? Um, but we have a problem also with methane. This is a very potent greenhouse gas. It's like 30 times more potent than CO2. But the problem is that a lot of methane is frozen in the Siberian tundra. So as the climate warms, the frozen ground thaws and it releases methane, which increase the greenhouse effects, further warming the planet which in turn thaws more tundra. Um, so you're seeing a double effect and unfortunately these emissions of methane are not in the uh, in these in the sort of um, evaluations for methane emissions. So these are extra, unfortunately these are on top, so this it means that the situation is perhaps more dire than we, you know, thought. Um, it's very difficult to quantify the, the magnitude of responses that these climate change occurrences are, are doing. And that's why climate scientists are uncertain about how quickly or how ferocious future climate change will be. There are other factors about the Earth's climate that's, that's, um, that are difficult to predict. How much heat is being stored in the deep ocean? Will the ice caps continue to melt slowly or will they very quickly slip into the ocean? We shouldn't have to wait around to see. We should take action now. Mm. You know, will patterns of precipitation change? You know, we see record hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you're seeing heat uh, the heat records being set every few months. Um, how will society respond to climate changes? You'll have uh, uh, farmlands of poorer nations that will become decimated because of climate change and they will turn into nations of refugees. They are talking about, I think, something like 12 or 13 million refugees from Bangladesh by 2030. It's a huge amount, you know, it's a huge amount of people wow. that would look to be rehoused somewhere in the West or in, or in cooler climates. Well, as a direct result as of a, climate change? Yes, as a direct result, because they, they already have a problem with, with, um, with their flooding. Um, but yes, that's what scientists are saying and governments are saying. Um, so, 
despite all of this uncertainty, you know, some the trends are discernible. Um, that the, the Arctic caps are rapidly shrinking, sea levels are rising, and you see a lot more uncertain weather. So there is, unfortunately, I, you know, don't want this episode to be too down, too, too dispiriting. But there is little scientific debate about the basic physics of climate change. How the Earth's climate system will respond to warming makes predictions of the future climate really uncertain. Heating is nearly constant, but cooling is diminished due to the increased concentration of greenhouse gases. You know, this imbalance between heating and cooling is the, uh, is the cause of the observed increase in temperature relative to historic values. So we really have to do something, for our, not for only ourselves, but for our children and for all future generations and for Tikhan Olam. We have to take a stand, we have to take Avraham's stands and say, Hineni, here I am, yeah. it's time to act, here I am. Yeah. Very good, wonderful, that is an absolutely fantastic exposition. Again, a very, very difficult technical subject, which, which you, uh, it, you've made it accessible. I, I honestly, it, it, it's a real eye-opener. Um, I want to thank you personally. Michael, I'm sure I speak on behalf of people who've been listening to these Shirim, these episodes over the, over the past six weeks. Um, and let's hope this will be a, a, a get people to make a more informed decision yeah. about how to act as humans and specifically as Jews. Yes. Because, you know, as you've mentioned several times, you know, we're supposed to be a light to the nations. Correct. So, Bezrat Hashem, this will be a, 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 a wonderful eye opener. And uh, yeah, let, let, let's let's usher in the era of change. Yes, I hope so. Thank and you very much, Michael. I thank you, Michael. It. And uh, hopefully, we'll we'll we'll, we'll um, be able to continue with with other related subjects. Um, yeah, but until then, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Now.